Ever wish you could travel back in time to see what life on Earth was like 500 million years ago? Well, in this video, we're going to be talking about early Paleozoic life. In other words, life that was around in the Cambrian and Ordovician periods of the Paleozoic era, which were the very first two periods of the Paleozoic era that went from around 542 to 444 million years ago. At this time, most life was in the sea. There were some protists and fungi that had potentially already moved into freshwater habitats and maybe moist land areas. And terrestrial environments were mostly barren, but newly inhabited by certain types of flora in the Ordovician, which we'll go over. And what's so exciting about the Cambrian period is that it marks the first time that life left a conspicuous fossil record in Earth's history because skeletons or hard parts had become abundant among life forms because of many reasons that I talk about in the Cambrian explosion video. But because of these skeletons and hard parts, the preservation of this life was a lot more likely. But there was a very early part of the Cambrian in which skeletons hadn't become that abundant yet and therefore during this period most of the fossil record was trace fossils like burrows of burrowing worm type things that were around at the time. One of these distinctive Cambrian burrows that kind of helps mark the base of the Cambrian is called Treptichmus pedum and these burrows are index fossils for the base of the Cambrian because they weren't around before and they were around after. And they're distinctly different from pre-Cambrian burrows because there were burrows before the Cambrian, but these were distinctly more complex. They were complex branching burrows that looked like a twisted rope, as you can see in the images here. But this is only one of many ways that Cambrian organisms were more complex than pre-Cambrian organisms. Like I discussed in that Cambrian explosion video, which I'll link up here to the top right if you want to go see, skeletons evolved and became massively abundant very quickly because of an increase in predation as well as calcium and phosphorus flux to the ocean, which allowed for materials to make skeletons out of. But even so, it wasn't just that the Precambrian organisms were the same as in the Cambrian except with skeletons. It was very different organisms. And in fact, even in the early Cambrian alone, there are three distinct intervals with distinct fauna that we should talk about because each interval had very different fauna. The first was the lowermost Cambrian with simple tube or vase shaped aragonitic skeletal fossils. And aragonite, by the way, is a calcium carbonate mineral, the same composition as calcite, but different in structure. And these organisms represented only a slight advance from pre-Cambrian fauna. And this would have been the time in which those burrows that I showed on the previous slide occurred and first showed up. But then there was, and excuse the way I pronounce this word, because I have no idea how it's pronounced. I've only ever read it, but it's the Timotion. I, I looked it up how to pronounce it. And the one thing I found said Timotion, which sounds weird for that. But anyway, the Timotion fauna, um, um, this was the second interval, which we'll talk about on the next slide. And the third interval was large skeletonized fauna, which were distinct from the Timotion fauna. So let's talk about the Timotion fauna. So this was that second interval. And instead of aragoninic fossils, there were calcite fossils from this time. Again, same composition as aragonite, but different structure, potentially representing a slightly different ocean composition potentially from an influx of different minerals to the ocean in the early Cambrian. And most of the small to motion skeletal elements can't be assigned to modern fauna or modern classes or groups of fauna in any way. The only to motion fauna groups or groups of animals that included those types of fauna that survive today include sponges, monoplacophorans, a type of mollusk, and brachiopods. All the other types of Timotion fauna and skeletal elements just were weird things that happened that one time in Earth's history that kind of ended when they went extinct. They're not representatives or ancestors of anything. It was more like evolutionary experimentation, which I'll talk about 
on a later slide as well. But after this interval was the third large skeletonized animals interval. And these guys showed up after, for unknown reasons, the Timotian fauna went extinct or disappeared after only around three to four million years of existing, which is really kind of a short time in geologic time scales for an entire fauna ecosystem to exist for. So it was really this time of trying things. And if they didn't work, we try new things. And the new thing at this time was the third interval, which was large skeletal animals that differed quite distinctly from the Timotian fauna in two main ways, size in which they were much larger, and most of them belonged to modern phyla. The only Timotian fauna to survive and continue living until today were sponges, monoplacophorans, and brachiopods, which for the most part had been around before the Timotian fauna. They in fact had representatives living in the Ediacaran before the Cambrian period, um, or at least for sponges, not for brachiopods and potentially for monoplacophorans, but I think it's not fully uh, known for that. But the point is those guys lived and all the other Timotian fauna were nothing like what lives today. Whereas this new group of large skeletal organisms are the ancestors to what lives today, which means that after all these different intervals of trying things, evolution finally got something that stuck for billions of years till now. Oh, actually not billions, sorry, half a million years, because this was only 500 million years ago. Uh, so it stuck. This third interval of organisms, this was the answer that evolution was randomly trying things, then boom, this one was, you know, really successful. Some of the most successful organisms in this group of fauna were arthropods, which obviously we have around today. I think they're actually like the most diverse phyla today. Uh, I could be wrong about that, but they've been kind of like the top dogs in terms of diversity, like throughout Earth's history. I mean, arthropods include insects, crustaceans, all the creepy crawlies, which there are major diversities among. And arthropods in the early Cambrian would have been both burrowing and planktonic forms and trilobites were around and they were so diverse they could burrow or be planktonic or floating and trilobites had specialized eyes that helped spot predators because that was really evolutionarily advantageous during that time since predators were rapidly evolving and advancing and also abundant during that time along with the trilobites and other arthropods were mollusks, inarticulate brachiopods, and we'll talk about articulate brachiopods later because they weren't really around yet, and various echinoderms such as crinoids, which I'll show images of and talk about later as well. But during this third interval, it wasn't all large skeletonized organisms. There were also still soft-bodied organisms. They hadn't been replaced by the skeletonized things. They were still there. They were just less abundant, especially those that couldn't burrow very deep or couldn't swim or move away from predators. Those were less protected, but those that could burrow or swim were still around and still abundant. And these included cnidarians such as jellies, segmented worms, soft arthropods. Not all arthropods had calcite mineralized skeletons like trilobites, uh, predator worms, which I didn't know was a thing to I was reading about this um, and all of these worm type things were burrowers. Jellies obviously could swim and soft arthropods could move around or swim. And these were all around in addition to the skeletonized organisms. But again, the most diverse were arthropods and something that was related to arthropods that was probably one of the sole reasons for many evolutionary adaptations and other smaller prey organisms was Anomalocaris. This is a genus of Anomalocarid uh, or a, a, type, a group of these weird swimming arthropod-like predators. And these got up to two meters or six feet in length. And of course they swam and that's how they went after and caught prey. And they actually impaled their prey with spines and their frontal appendages. You know, we're grateful they're extinct now. <laughs> and they had eyes on stalks, which were also good for hunting. So these were just really important organisms or a group of organisms for just the evolution of everything else, because these were the top dogs. These were the top predators that were driving the evolutionary changes and other 
other prey organisms because those prey had to get away or had to protect themselves with a hard skeleton or had to burrow or whatever. But these guys were the drivers for those evolutionary changes. But even though these organisms in the early Cambrian were more complex than the pre-Cambrian organisms, there were still relatively few modes of life. It was still pretty much mostly seafloor dwellers, things that lived on the seafloor. Burrowers, obviously, still from the pre-Cambrian, at least at shallow depths. Organisms that were attached to the seafloor, again, these are seafloor dwellers, but they're attached and they, you know, either suspension feed or whatever. Free living and moving organisms were around, but many were deposit feeders, meaning they ate organic matter from the sediment. So they were still on the seafloor, basically just moving around on it. And grazers like monoplacophorans, those mollusks I mentioned earlier, that like to graze on bacterial mats, which are these big mounds behind the anomalcaris here, um, and algal mats and things. So those guys would attach to the mats and graze on them. And like I mentioned, attached organisms like brachiopods or echinoderms or rhinoids, like these things shown here, um, were suspension feeders that fed on organic matter in the water. But in the Cambrian, these attached organisms, especially the crinoids, had distinctly shorter stalks or that cord that attaches them that was distinctly shorter in the Cambrian. Whereas later on, this is representing the Ordovician over here in the right, they got much longer and very links and whatever. And even now, crinoids have evolved to swim. So they're unattached. Their stalks are not there or they just aren't attached to the sediment and they swim around. Um, so the Cambrian crinoids were obviously still relatively limited in what they could do and the heights that they could live at. And you might be wondering, were there any reefs? I mean, we have these major coral reef communities today that host a lot of different organisms. So were there reefs in the Cambrian? And the answer is yes. The earliest reefs likely formed in the Timotian, the second interval of the early Cambrian. And the main reef builders in the early Cambrian were archaeocyathids. Archaeocyathids were kind of just like simple vase shaped organisms that were attached and they had these distinctive uh, circle looking fossils that they left behind here because that's what they look like from the top of their vase. And they were suspension feeders that pumped water through their vase shaped skeletons. And we think that their most general body plan is most similar to sponges, simple sponges. They, you know, suspension feed and they're very similar in many ways, but we're not totally sure that they belong to the sponge phylum or a different phylum or maybe not even a modern phylum at all, because spoiler alert, they ended up going extinct. But We'll get to that in a second. Um, the other things that helped build reefs at the time that contributed to the archaeocyathid reefs were tabulate corals, as well as archaeocyathid encrusting microbes, so microbes that encrusted the archaeocyathids, that kind of connected them all together. And so these guys both contributed to reefs um, in the early Cambrian. But by the end of the early Cambrian, the beginning of the mid-Cambrian, archaeocyathids when extinct, they just disappeared. They were completely widespread. They were dominating. They were super happy. And then boom, they disappeared. The tabulate corals that helped them build reefs in the early Cambrian also disappeared at this time. But the tabulates came back in the Ordovician. However, the question remains, were the Cambrian, early Cambrian tabulates that it disappeared in the mid Cambrian, the same ones that came back later and they just didn't leave a fossil record in between because they just weren't abundant? Or were Cambrian tabulates not tabulates at all? Were they completely different? And then some similar, physically similar organisms re evolved in the Ordovician that we now call tabulate corals. We don't know the answer to these questions still. Both are still mysteries. The disappearance of the archaeocyathids, which were the most dominant reef builders at the time, uh, we don't know why that happened. We also don't know whether the tabulate corals just didn't leave a fossil record in between the mid-Cambrian to the Ordovician and why that would have been. Uh, we don't know. It's mysterious and I find it incredibly interesting, but I wish I could tell you more about it. We just don't know. What we do know is that the entire Cambrian period is full of mysterious disappearances and extinctions because it was a time of what's called 
evolutionary experimentation. This means that many groups of animals with different body plans were tried out and then died out very shortly after, or on geologic timescales shortly after. And only a few succeeded, a few large groups or phyla succeeded to survive past the early Paleozoic and even to today, some of them. And the succeeding body plans that survived past the early Cambrian include sponges, snails, brachiopods, and trilobites, the first three of which all still survive today. Trilobites went extinct at the end of the Paleozoic era, but arthropods, the group they belong to, are still going strong. So all the rest of the organisms that were tried out, or the body plans that were tried out in the Cambrian, just mysteriously disappeared at some point after after they evolved. And so clearly they weren't good. They weren't good body plans, or at least not for that time and that environment in which they evolved. It's interesting to think about this time in Earth's history, because if you think about it, if the environments had been at all different that this explosion of life was occurring in and this experimentation of evolution was occurring in, then the thing that would have worked, the body plans that would have succeeded would have been drastically different because it's all dependent on environment. So if this had ever happened at a different time in you know, a parallel universe somewhere, it would have turned out very different and the organisms that live today would be very different and we might not be here. But now moving on to Cambrian vertebrates. The earliest vertebrates called conodonts evolved in the early Cambrian, late in the early Cambrian. And vertebrates are things with backbones. Us, you know, humans are vertebrates. And uh, we all stem from these very first vertebrates that evolved 500-ish million years ago. And conodonts are really only known in the fossil record from their hard parts, which is just their teeth. Their bodies were soft and rarely preserved. But we we do have a couple uh, conodont bodies. Actually, for a long time, we had no idea what these guys looked like because all we had were teeth. And then finally, we found a soft bodied preservation and a very pristine uh, preservation environment, thank goodness, that preserved one of the bodies. And now we know that they looked you know, pretty simple, like, you know, wormy fish like things. Later in the mid to late Cambrian, fish did evolve, but they were only preserved in fragments during this period, and they were likely deposit feeders and just very primitive body structures, and the fully preserved fish in the fossil record we don't find until the Silurian to Devonian period. So not even in the Ordovician, we wait till the Silurian and Devonian, the mid Paleozoic, to see fully preserved fish fossils. One of the reasons we know so much about soft-bodied organisms from the Cambrian, as well as the skeletonized organisms in the Cambrian, is the Burgess Shale. This is a shale formation in British Columbia that preserved pristine soft-bodied animals from this time. The spectacular preservation in these shales was due to anoxic conditions. Basically, we'll talk about how this environment formed and why the preservation was so good in the early Paleozoic geology video, but these anoxic conditions just prevented burrowers or, you know, animals that were going to eat or decompose the animals that had died and fallen to the sediment. They prevented those from being around because those things can't be around when conditions don't have oxygen or are anoxic. So we'll talk about that in the geology video, but because these conditions were so pristine, the Burgess shale fauna include early chordates, things with, you know, vertebrates or primitive notochords, which became fully developed spines later on. And uh, arthropods, of course, were the most diverse organisms in the Burgess shale, as they are in most of the rock record. And we can see a trilobite fossil here and an anomalocaris here, which of course weren't arthropods, but were closely related. And segmented worms, many worms are found in the Burgess shale because where else would they be preserved because they're soft-bodied organisms. So the uh, Burgess shale is very important for filling out the soft-bodied side of the organisms that were around in the Cambrian. Now moving from Cambrian to Ordovician life, still in the early Paleozoic, remember, it includes both the Cambrian and Ordovician periods. The Ordovician marked the recovery of trilobites after they had undergone mass extinction at the end of the Cambrian period. In fact, they had undergone like six mass extinctions in the late Cambrian, and we'll talk about those six events in the early Paleozoic geology video, but they did recover in the Ordovician along with 
brachiopods and snails, which flourished alongside trilobites at this time, and floaters and swimmers in the Ordovician included things like nautiloids, as shown here, this big cephalopod with the tentacles here, as well as graptolites, which I don't have shown here, but those things were floating in the water column, almost kind of like jellyfish, but they're not jellyfish. They're like a whole different phyla. Um, they're extinct now, but the fact that they're extinct makes them very good index fossils for this time range. Uh, and these both drastically expanded in the Ordovician. And like modern nautiluses or types of cephalopods we have today, the nautiloids were predators that used jet propulsion and tentacles to chase and catch their prey. Nautiloids, however, were present in the Cambrian before the Ordovician, but diversified and spread in the Ordovician greatly. But they were not the first cephalopods. In fact, the first cephalopods were soft-bodied. They didn't have this shell here like the nautiloids have, and they date back to the Middle Cambrian. This is super significant because this means that the shells of cephalopods evolved independently from other mollusks. So cephalopods evolved from other mollusks like bivalves and gastropods that were already around at the time. But cephalopods were first soft-bodied organisms. So clearly they evolved their shells, like the nautiloids have here, independently from mollusks, just indicating how advantageous evolutionarily shells were to have, even for this big predator, the nautiloid here, for protection. So it's just a really cool event of convergent evolution, I think. But what defines the Ordovician in terms of evolution is the greatest, most dramatic evolutionary expansion of all time, in which a threefold increase in the number of marine animal families occurred. And this was called the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event, which I actually talked about in an older video about early Paleozoic oxygen history. I'll link it up here if you want to check it out. So in terms of some Ordovician diversification among invertebrates, we had burrowing bivalves become the most successful burrowing suspension feeders with shells. We had new burrowing trilobites evolve. We had articulate brachiopods diversify and become the most conspicuous fossils in Paleozoic rocks, as they did throughout the rest of the Paleozoic as well. And as you can see here, articulate brachiopods had evolved by then and also diversified rather than just the inarticulate brachiopods that were around in the early Cambrian. Crinoids radiated and formed complex communities that were of various lengths and heights, as we talked about earlier, as well as what I call crinoid meadows that were basically, I mean, the crinoids are like the pretty flowers of the seafloor at this time. So here's this kind of painting of, you know, it looks like a garden, but it's the sea during this time where you've got the crinoids attached, you've got the starfish here, you've got some rugos corals, you've got other organisms. And it's just, I mean, the crinoids are the flowers. They're so cool. And lastly, we have the bryozoans, which had evolved in the late Cambrian, but diversified and even built small reefs of their own in the Ordovician. Speaking of reefs, where are the reefs after archaeocyathids went extinct? Archaeocyathids were the major reef builders in the early Cambrian, and they went extinct at the mid-Cambrian. So what happened to reefs? Well, Rugo's corals kind of became one of the major reef builders in the Ordovician period, as did tabulate corals, which came back in the Ordovician and or evolved independently from the previous tabulates. We don't know. Um, and these contributed to reefs, as did stromatoporoids, which are potentially sponges, but we're not totally sure, um, but stromatoporoids also uh, contributed, which is why the Ordovician reefs and other mid-Paleozoic, mid to late Paleozoic reefs are called coral strom reefs because they're corals and stromatoporoids. And these were the first major reefs since the Archaeocyathids were building reefs in the early Cambrian. So really there was a reef hiatus from the end of the early Cambrian until the Ordovician diversification. And these coral strom reefs thrived until the mid-ish late Paleozoic and then dwindled and then went extinct. But of course, as we know, later on, corals did kind of re-evolve because we have corals today, but they're not any of these types of organisms, actually. 
The expansion of nautiloids, those big cone shell predators here, caused an extreme advancement in predation in the Ordovician. And some Ordovician nautiloids reached three meters or 10 feet in length, longer than the largest Anomalocaris we were talking about in the Cambrian. However, joining them wasn't actually swimming predators, but actually predators on the seafloor that were at the time represented by the newly evolved and diversified sea stars. And these sea stars may look very sweet and gentle, but they are pretty vicious. And this advancement in predation, both on the seafloor and in the water column, caused major advancements in evolution of those species that they preyed on. And the last major evolutionary event we'll talk about for the early Cambrian was the expansion of land plants. That's right, the land wasn't completely barren of everything. Now, there weren't large vascular seed plants like trees just yet. Those we'll talk about in later mid-Paleozoic time ranges. But in the early Paleozoic, there did come some small non-vascular plants like mosses that had made the move to land and these made quite the impact. Even though they seem small and not, you know, doing much, they're doing a lot. They in fact altered landscapes enough to increase the nutrient flux to the ocean enough to cause major climate change, which ended up causing mass extinction. In fact, the first mass extinction of the big five mass extinctions throughout the Phanerozoic Eon. But I talk about that in my Ordovician mass extinction video. If you want to check it out, I'll pop it up here on the screen or it'll show up in a second um, after I stop rambling on. But if you want to check out my major reference for this and other videos in the Earth History playlist, it is in my description down below. It's called Earth Systems History. And I also have other minor and supporting references down there. And if you want any behind the scenes or extra content, uh, you can join down below, become a channel member, and you'll get perks and extra content and all of that. Um, but if you are not able to financially support me, I totally understand. You can still press the like button down below, which is totally free. And I would greatly appreciate that. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. And I can't wait to see you guys next time. Bye.